Hey everyone, welcome back to Nurse Wellbeing Mission Podcast. I am Nathan Ilman, I am your host for today. It's great to be back doing a solo episode. It's been several months since I've been here doing one of these. I've just been enjoying interviewing other guests who have conducted research and are interested in some great aspects of nurse and midwife well-being. And we've been sharing their work as well as some of my own reflections on that over the past few months. But here I am today to talk to you about something I am very passionate about. It's an area of my own expertise and, and special interest from stemming from when I did my doctoral research many years ago. And it's something that I truly believe all nurses and midwives should be provided education and training in. Can you guess what it is? It's sleep. So sleep is this crucial thing that we all do every day, or hopefully at least once a day, and is so vital for our well-being, for our mental and physical well-being. But it's just not talked about enough, in my opinion. So I'm going to be doing a number of different episodes over the months and I guess years talking about sleep and tapping into specific aspects of sleep because it is a huge topic but today I'm going to be focusing on the basics about why sleep is important, why we sleep, sort of how we sleep and talking through some important sleep tips, some of which you may have heard but I'm pretty sure some of these you wouldn't have heard before as well. And towards the end, I'm going to be getting you to reflect on your own sleep and your own sleep routine and and invite you to consider how you might want to try doing things differently to improve your own sleep. So me doing this podcast episode comes off the back of me uh, preparing a, a workshop that I'm delivering this week, in fact, to a group of mental health nursing students. And I really can't wait to do this. Sleep is a tool which we can all utilise to improve not just our well-being but our performance as well in the workplace. Let's kick off then with a bit more of an understanding about that importance of sleep. I'm not going to go into the details of all of the research on this topic because there's just too much quite frankly to cover But needless to say, sleep has been found in countless research studies and systematic reviews and meta-analyses. These are big studies that basically pull together all of the data that we know about the effects of sleep on different kind of variables like our immune functioning, for example, or uh, the likelihood that we're going to develop something like depression. And the data is so clear that getting between seven to nine hours sleep regularly per night is absolutely crucial for protecting against pretty much any physical or mental health condition that you can think of, really. So what we see in the research literature is that people who regularly get less than six and definitely less than five hours of sleep per night have an increased all-cause mortality risk. So basically you're going to die younger if you have a lifetime full of uh, chronically short sleep. You have an increased risk of developing dementia, different cancers, cardiovascular disease. The list just goes on and on and on. So chronically short sleep or heavily interrupted sleep leads to problems with inflammation in the body that leads to deterioration in our immune functioning makes us more susceptible to stress and that makes us more likely to develop some of these conditions and the same is true for mental health problems as well so some of you may know this you may be experiencing a mental health difficulty right now actually you may perhaps you're feeling depressed right now and you may know that actually your sleep is is somewhat off Since you've been depressed, perhaps you're sleeping more than usual or less than usual. So we know that uh, mental health conditions actually interact with sleep and that uh, they can make sleep longer or shorter, but actually poor sleep also predicts mental ill health. So we know that people who have a history of insomnia 
and sleep difficulties are much more likely to then go on and develop things like depression. Really interesting line of research looks at sleep difficulties in adolescents and young people and, and actually predicts sleep difficulties uh, can predict the extent to which someone is more likely to develop something like schizophrenia, psychosis. So this is a really serious mental health condition. So all of this points to the importance of understanding sleep and improving our sleep. It's, it's what we call a preventative mental health measure. If we can get in there early and help people uh, understand more about their own sleep and perhaps what's getting in the way of them uh, getting better sleep, if we can intervene early, we can, we can uh, cut off and prevent many of these difficulties. Now, as a nurse or midwife, whatever stage you're at in your career, whether you are training, you're newly qualified, or whether you're very experienced, you probably would have already experienced some degree of sleep difficulty at some stage because of one common factor that is a thread throughout the career of the nurse or midwife, and that's a higher level of stress than most other occupations. You would have experienced it at some stage, whether it's stress during exams when you're a student, or stress in your day job, working in, in a particularly uh, uncertain or threatening environment. And this is of course something that can impact uh, nurse and midwife sleep quality. And what we know from the research as well is that rates of insomnia which I'm going to go into in a little bit, we'll sort of give you a definition of insomnia. Rates of insomnia and sleep difficulties are higher in, in nurses and midwives than the general population. And there are certain aspects related to the job role, uh, hours that people work that contribute to this, but this ongoing stress is largely a contributing factor. So when I talk about insomnia, what I mean is when someone has difficulty getting off to sleep, you know, it takes longer than half an hour or so each night, or they have difficulties with waking up in the middle of the night, so waking up multiple times and being aware of that. Uh, when you wake up, being awake for a long time, so being awake for longer than like 20 minutes at a time, or waking up very early in the morning and then not get, being able to get back to sleep at all. So for example, going to bed at 10 p.m. and you wake up at say 4 a.m. and you just cannot get back to sleep at all. Or maybe it takes you hours to get back to sleep and then finally you do. And then another sort of key defining feature of insomnia is that it has an impact on you day to day. You feel sleepy and tired and it's affecting perhaps the quality of your relationships or it's affecting your work performance. Now insomnia is the most common what's called sleep disorder. You know, it's something that can be diagnosed by doctors, by psychologists, by psychiatrists and it really makes up the largest proportion of all of the sleep disorders. In this podcast episode I'm not going to go into other sleep difficulties. One of the most common other sleep difficulties is obstructive sleep apnea and this is essentially a breathing difficulty. I'm not going to go into that here, we're just going to be talking about regular sleep uh, and how to get better sleep. And so I'm actually going to be specifically focusing on insomnia in another episode. In this episode we're just going to be going through some basic sleep tips that should help to optimize sleep for people who are on a relatively regular kind of sleep pattern. So again because shift work is quite a specific area and shift work sleep disorder is another potential diagnosis that people can have as well as insomnia that really warrants specific attention which I'll cover in another episode. So let's just do a quick basic overview of how sleep works because I guess a lot of people probably haven't even got much of an understanding of this. We're all human beings right and we all sleep, we all do this thing, we all go to bed and we close our eyes and hopefully we fall asleep and we wake up feeling refreshed in the morning and we know that we tend to do this at night and sometimes we'll do it during the day if we're feeling sleepy and we want a nap. 
but we're not really aware of exactly how it works. So I want to give you really just a basic overview of this without going too much into the neurobiology of it, just enough to hopefully help your understanding of how sleep works. So you may have guessed that sleep is largely influenced and triggered by light and dark cycles. You probably have an intuitive understanding of this already because you know that you go to sleep when it's dark, generally, apart from the summer when it's a bit lighter in the evenings. So something that's important to understand is that sleep is an evolutionary mechanism. We often forget that we evolved over millions of years. So all these things that we do now, all of our behaviours and the way our body works, is the result of millions of years of evolution, of starting out as single cell organisms and coming all the way up to what we are now. So sleep is classed as a behaviour just as walking or talking or thinking is a behaviour or our behaviours as well. So it's a behaviour that human beings and some, but not all animals in the animal kingdom, also developed as an evolutionary mechanism. And whilst science is still trying to understand exactly all of the reasons we sleep, one of the, the basic ways of understanding this is that it serves a restorative function for us. You know, I mentioned at the beginning there that if we don't sleep, we develop all of these problems, our health, physically and mentally. So therefore, when we sleep, there is a cascade of neurobiological processes happening in our brain and body that serves to do things like repair DNA, to grow muscle, um, to, to repair injuries, for example, and to get rid of the buildup of stuff in our brain that has been happening during the day to refresh us and to help us be more cognitively able the following day. Now, when we wake up in the morning, what happens is daylight enters our brain via our eyes and that sets off a neurobiological process that continues throughout the rest of the day. So sleep as a behavior is very much influenced by sunlight. And that's gonna lead us on to one of our sleep tips later on. So when our brain starts receiving this sunlight input, it leads to certain things happening in our brain. So I'll just explain one of them because many people have heard of melatonin. Many people these days take melatonin as a supplement in the evening to help them get off to sleep. So let's just quickly cover what melatonin is and why it's important and actually what happens in our body naturally without us taking it. So in the morning when we wake up, daylight, sunlight that enters our brain helps to stop the production and the release of melatonin. And then what happens after that is we have a period of high arousal in the morning. So basically the stress response, we have cortisol, which gets pumped around our bodies and helps to make us alert. And then our body temperature is very much influenced by this light and dark, dark cycle as well. I'm not going to go too much into that, but essentially what happens is when we're feeling sleepy, our body temperature has often dipped and we need our body temperature to be slightly lower when we're going to sleep. Otherwise we really struggle and that's why it's difficult to sleep in the summer. So for most people, you wake up in the morning, uh, this melatonin production stops, you start to feel more alert, your alertness tends to increase. And then what happens is we all have this natural point in the afternoon around between 2 and 4 p.m. where our body temperature takes another natural dip and we start to feel sleepy again. So everyone experiences this to some degree or another. It's completely normal to feel sleepy around that time. And in fact, historically, it's thought that human beings often would sleep during that time. So it's only a more recent thing in our evolutionary past that we have this single block of sleep at night for eight hours. Not even that long ago, several hundred, several hundred years ago, uh, there's records of humans in different cultures, different civilization societies, actually sleeping two or three times throughout the day. So that natural dip 
in the afternoon is something that happens to all of us and that's why people in certain countries like uh, in Central Europe for example where it gets hot in countries like Spain they have a siesta in the afternoon so as the evening um, approaches if we haven't slept in the afternoon sleep pressure increases so that's basically us feeling more sleepy and then as it gets to the evening time that melatonin production starts again and again this is influenced by light and dark so as it starts to get dark melatonin uh, increases we start to feel sleepy and as long as we're not too aroused uh, that means basically wired as long as our brain is not kind of overactive and we feel sleepy if we've got good sleep habits which we'll explain shortly we go to bed and we fall asleep so just to let you know there are two things that I've mentioned there already that are quite important to know about how sleep works and what actually can get in the way of sleep working how it should do as well so what the first is what I mentioned about sleep pressure so sleep pressure or sleep drive is just that feeling of sleepiness that accrues throughout the day it can be uh, exacerbated or sped up if you like by exerting more energy throughout the day if you do if you ran a marathon in the morning then of course you're going to feel sleepier in the afternoon and it can accumulate over time as well so if we are if you're working 12 hour shifts and then you're not sleeping well at night of course that sleep pressure is going to build and build and build and build the only thing that can cure sleep pressure is sleep so whilst resting with our eyes closed or resting is extremely beneficial and we definitely all need to be doing more of that that sleep pressure itself is not going to be taken away until we actually sleep and we're not going to get the beneficial effect on our mind and body until we sleep if we're napping in the afternoon then that does reduce that sleep pressure so research suggests that we shouldn't really nap after about 3 p.m. in the afternoon and if you're going to take a nap we shouldn't really be napping for longer than 20 to 30 minutes and it, there's, there's some variation between people here but of course the problem is that if we sleep too late and for too long it reduces the sleep pressure and then when it gets to the evening time you're just not sleepy enough to go back to sleep and then that might make you develop bad habits around staying up and watching television and doing other things and that can, uh, can affect your whole sleep schedule. So naps are good, naps have been shown to be beneficial for uh, giving you a boost of energy and for improving cognitive performance so they're definitely not something that we want to avoid if we're sleepy and we have the opportunity to nap but just keeping them short and making sure they're done at the right time is crucial and individual people can experiment with when they nap when it has the best effect for them and how long they can nap for as well so that's sleep pressure the other one I mentioned was arousal so arousal is something that is related to stress and this is why it's a really important thing I believe for nurses and midwives to understand is that when we get towards the evening our body is naturally trying to gear itself towards sleep because it is such a natural process your brain and body want to sleep it shouldn't be something that we're trying to control it's just as natural as opening your bowels or feeling hungry and, and eating but when we're experiencing a lot of stress this can create arousal in our brain and our body so stress hormones being released that interfere with that natural biological process so you all would have had this experience at some stage in your life it might be now if you're unlucky I've certainly had this myself where there's been something on your mind so it's not even like a threat in the external world it's something perhaps that you're worried about that is leading to the stress response being activated in your body you feel tired you feel shattered you've been doing a long shift 
You go to bed, you just desperately want to sleep and then you're lying there wide awake and you cannot fall asleep. And that's because the arousal level for you is too high. So in these sleep tips that I'm about to go into, I'm going to talk a little bit about this and ways that you can address that and hopefully feel a bit more relaxed before you go to sleep. When I come back to insomnia specifically and talk about treatments and approaches for insomnia, I'll go into much more detail about this arousal and, and how it relates to uh, the relationship we have to sleeping and the relationship we have to being in our bed as well. Because sometimes people develop almost a fear of sleeping and that gets in the way of falling asleep. So I'm going to run through my top sleep tips for you guys. We're going to start in the morning from when you wake up. So when you wake up in the morning, I've explained that sleep is influenced very heavily by the natural chaining rhythm of light and dark cycles. Now this is something that a lot of people don't know, but getting exposure to early morning light outside, so it is actually going into your eyes and your brain, actually helps sleep at night. And if you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense. So for, it took hundreds of millions of years for us to get to where we are now with our sleep and the way our brains work. And historically, we were spending much more time outside. And the evolutionary process adapted us to this 24 hour cycle and to the sun and darkness. So there is something about the wavelength of morning light which helps to trigger this cascade of neurobiological events in our brain that then actually helps us sleep better at night, it helps us get off to sleep better because of the melatonin and then that can help us have better quality sleep. So my tip number one is get out in the morning and go for a walk. If you've got a dog, maybe you do this already. For me, I've got a toddler. I like to take him outside in the road to play football uh, this is ideally before about 9 a.m. we're doing this. So, so on a sunny day in the morning, even just 10 minutes can be enough for this. On a really cloudy overcast day, 20 to 30 minutes ideally. But still, even if you can just get outside and go for a walk, that will help with this sleep process. And it's also good just to be outdoors. You might be outside with nature if you do that. And you might also be getting exercise if you're able to go for a walk. So if you can build that into your routine, that is going to have beneficial effects for you. Moving on from that and very much related is exercise. So the research that looks at the relationship between physical activity, exercise and sleep is, is, is just so clear. So whether it's cardiovascular exercise where we're moving our body quite intensely and our heart rate's getting up and we're sweating or even strength training or even things like yoga which are a bit more restorative it might involve a bit more stretching and slower movements really any kind of activity that gets our body moving quite a bit is beneficial for sleep so I like to exercise every day, even if it's only for 15 minutes, because I know that it's going to benefit my sleep later at night. So the best way to do this, if you're not already doing regular exercise, is combine those two things that I just said. So go for a brisk walk in the morning for 20 minutes before you start your shift, for example. And that is going to be beneficial for your sleep. It's going to be a double whammy. You're going to get the morning light you're going to get your heart rate up and that is going to help you sleep at night. So find something that is enjoyable for you. Don't feel like you have to go running or you have to lift weights because everyone else is doing that. Even taking dance classes or um, doing, like I said, doing yoga, for example, has also been found beneficial for sleep. So moving throughout the rest of the day and we're getting towards the evening period now, so let's talk about some tips for the evening time. So screen use. Now, the research on screen use is a little bit more nuanced and complex than what people might have originally thought. 
different people react differently to, to different things they're watching or consuming in the evening. Some people might be able to scroll through their phone on social media and be relatively unaffected by things. Some people might be able to watch a horror movie, but then be able to kind of calm down quite easily afterwards. Each individual person is quite different. But I just want to tell you about one piece of research which I read recently, which I think is really relevant and helpful to know about the use of smartphones. Now, let's face it, most of the time, if we are using our phone before bed, it's probably not helping us relax. There's probably some degree of social comparison going on if you're on Facebook or Instagram or something like that. And that is leading to this increase in arousal and anxiety, which you don't want before you go to sleep. So setting yourself a rule of not looking at your phone after a certain time in the evening is really helpful. One recent research study found that in one group of people who were asked to stop using their phone 30 minutes before bed and to leave it outside their bedroom, this was compared to a group of people who were allowed to just continue with their smartphone use. The no phone in room overnight group, after four weeks, had uh, improved sleep quality, they got off to sleep quicker, they felt more refreshed, and they even had better cognitive performance on one task because they were getting better sleep. So this is something I've started doing recently as well. I'm leaving my phone downstairs to charge, and I've bought myself a lamp that's uh, a light to wake me up because uh, I used to use my phone as an alarm. So you can buy an alarm clock to prevent the need for having your phone. Uh, this can be a really, really helpful thing, especially if you know you're someone who likes to scroll, you get sucked into your phone, uh, and, and you start to feel anxious and aroused from that in the evenings. Now, the next one is about having a solid routine for going to sleep. So when I speak to lots of people, they often have this chopping and changing routine, even if they don't do night shifts. So remember here, I'm talking uh, or speaking to people listening to this who are currently not working night shifts, you're working regular day shifts. Like I said, we'll come back to night shifts in a separate episode. If you're a nine to five-ish sort of person, really what we wanna be doing is going to bed at the same time each evening and waking up at the same time. Because sleep is a behavior, you start to associate certain things with being sleepy and your sleep quality will improve if your brain has that predictability of when it's gonna go to sleep and when it's gonna get up. Quite simply, your brain and body just get into a rhythm you will be able to fall asleep quicker because there is a level of expectancy with your brain that you're gonna to go to bed at a certain time. You'll feel sleepy at the same time and then you'll be get used to waking up at the same time. So in the morning, you'll start to feel more alert as well because you'll start getting more consistent sleep. So one of the problems I commonly see is people chopping and changing, going to bed at midnight one night, waking up early, next night then going to bed at 9 p.m., waking up early, and then it kind of changes depending on what they're doing. Now look, I'm aware that if you are a student, for example, or you might be an older person who enjoys your nightlife going out, it's impossible to have the same routine every single night of the week. I get it, I was there, I used to be that person. When I was younger, my sleep habits were absolutely terrible. I was out partying, doing all sorts and staying up late into the night. But you know what? I suffered because of it. So looking back, I wish that I had had a bit more of an education and a bit more support around getting more regular sleep around the other days of the week when I wasn't going out because those bad habits then spilled into the other nights when I wasn't necessarily going out to a nightclub or something. I might have just been at home with my housemates or my flatmates, but uh, bad habits persisted and maybe I was getting a late night here, an early night there, a late night here, an early night there. So setting yourself a reasonable bedtime and then waking up at the same time in the morning. And in fact, that part 
has been shown to be the most effective thing. So if you wake yourself up at the same time and you get up out of bed, because then what happens is, again, your brain gets used to this and it, and it leads to this, this kind of rhythm throughout the rest of the day that your body gets used to. And of course, if you get up at the same time every day without exception, there's a guarantee that by the night time, you're going to feel sleepy by a certain point as well. Whereas if you start sleeping in some days, then of course that shifts when you're sleepier later on in the day. Now related to this uh, routine or sort of fine tuning a routine, going to bed and waking up at the same time, I just want to talk a little bit about sleep debt and sleeping in on weekends. So whilst it may be tempting to cut yourself short of sleep during the week and then sleep in for like two or three hours extra on the weekend. Again, research shows that whilst, yes, in the short term, that might be beneficial for you. You might feel more refreshed on a Saturday, Sunday. You might feel, yes, I'm ready to attack the day at the weekend uh, and have be full of beans and have lots of energy. Sleep is not like a bank. You cannot take a withdrawal from the uh, sleep bank during the week uh, and then pay it back at the weekend and expect that that is going to be the same as having consistent sleep. So the long-term impact of that is detrimental for health because what you're doing is if, if for five days a week you're not sleeping enough, you're sleeping for five or six hours per night, so that is having a chronic impact on your body. Whether you like it or not, unfortunately, that, that's what the science shows. So it's creating that inflammation and stuff during the week. And whilst it may feel good at the weekend, it's a short-term benefit you're getting. So that's why, whilst it may feel difficult, actually getting this more consistent sleep seven nights a week is really important. So the next tip is around diet and what we eat before we go to bed. And one thing in particular I want to talk about, because again, this is quite a big topic and, a, and quite nuanced, is sugar. So I used to be a massive sugar fiend. My wife and I used to eat lots of sweet treats before bed. We used to eat chocolate and cookies and various things. Some of that was related to stress and feeling like, you know what, at the end of the day, I just want to reward myself with something. But it became a really nasty habit that we both had. And the research shows that sugar is not good for your sleep at all. It interrupts the natural cycles we go through. And whilst you may not necessarily notice it too much, it does have that effect when people are observed with, you know, kind of hooked up to specific monitors that are used for recording sleep quality. And again, the long-term impact of this is, is really detrimental. So my recommendation is think about other ways that you could treat yourself in the evenings. Are there things that don't contain sugar or could you just reduce your sugar intake in the evening? Something my wife and I did was the thought of cutting out anything sweet in the evening was was just awful. So what we started doing was baking um, other uh, baked goods that use fruit uh, fruit kind of substitutes instead. So for example, making a brownie that uses mashed banana instead of refined sugar, um, and and eating less of it basically. So we're just not having refined sugar, which is really the nasty type of sugar for our health and using something more natural but having less of it and that felt like a good compromise for us so perhaps give that a go the next one related to diet that i want to mention is alcohol so there is a myth that alcohol helps you sleep now of course alcohol can help you get off to sleep everyone's had that experience if you're a drinker you have a couple of beers a glass of wine you start to feel sleepy and yes it does initiate sleep because of its depressant effect on our nervous system but what actually happens later on in the night is when that alcohol gets synthesized in your body it becomes a stimulant and it wakes you up early and it actually leads to sleep disruption so it is not good for our sleep at all so even a small amount of alcohol at night it is is negative, is bad for our sleep. So people often convince themselves that one glass of wine won't make a difference. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that research shows that one glass of wine 
does make a difference. And the problem is over time, you might get used to that poor sleep and you might think that your sleep is okay, but it's not. It's, it's being negatively impacted by that alcohol. So replacing that drink in the evening with something else is going to be helpful. And one of the reasons that people drink and eat sugar and things in the evenings is because of it, it helping to manage stress or numb emotions or manage emotions. So again, this is something we're going to cover in the insomnia episode because it's really important to find ways to, to manage difficult feelings, especially in the evening. It's going to help with that sleep. Something I'm going to focus on here briefly, and this will be our last tip for this episode, is around managing anxiety and, and stress in the evening, and particularly worry. So as I mentioned, that arousal level increases uh, in the evening if we're feeling stressed, and that uh, interrupts that natural ability to fall asleep. So something that I really believe in is getting things out of our head. The more stuff is spinning around, this creates more stress. If you're overthinking things, perhaps, for example, uh, you're thinking about an assignment that you've got to do, you're thinking about uh, your patients at work from the shift, these things are going to increase that arousal, it's going to lead to cortisol being released into your body and it's going to make it hard for you to fall asleep. So getting things out of our head. So one is talking to someone about things. So whether it's your partner, whether you can share it with a friend, whether you have a, a psychologist or a coach or someone else who can support you, obviously you're not going to do that every night of the week, but I'd highly recommend that if you're struggling, because it will help with getting this stuff out and helping to manage that stress. Another really basic thing you can do though, if there's no one that you can talk to in the evening, is to write down what's stressing you out, your worries. So make it more tangible. Put your thoughts to bed before you go to bed. So do whatever planning and preparation you need to do for the next day. Uh, before bed, ideally not just before you go to bed, but maybe an hour or so before, and write down any worries you have. You can literally just write in a journal, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, I'm worried about that, and just give yourself permission to put them onto paper and tell yourself, I've got my worries on paper now, I'll give myself permission to think about those and deal with them tomorrow. Right now, I'm gonna allow myself to go to sleep. I give myself permission to go to sleep. So just doing that can be really, really helpful. Okay, so I've gone through quite a lot of tips there. There's been quite a lot of information. I really hope that you found this interesting and helpful. Like I said, I truly believe that all nurses and midwives should be given more of an understanding of sleep and given an opportunity to reflect on their own sleep, given support in improving that sleep. And like I said, that's what I'm going to be doing this week with one of my workshops for some nursing students. If you're listening to this and you think, wow, that would be really good for me and my team, then get in touch with me. You can find Nurse Wellbeing Mission on Facebook. You can find our website at nursewellbeingmission.com. You can find me on Instagram, it's at underscore Nurse Wellbeing Mission. You can find me on LinkedIn, if you just search my name, Nathan Illman, that's I-L-L-M-A-N. And what's the other one? Oh, Twitter. Yes, so on Twitter, at Nurse Wellbeing, or again, I think if you just search for my name, you'll find me on there, and reach out. So, listen, I will be back very soon for some more sleep and other wellbeing tips and other amazing episodes with interviews and conversations with people that I'm excited to bring you. I hope you're all well and see you soon.